Today we're gonna get visited by the ghosts of Pico 8 Updates Present, Pico 8 Updates Past and Pico 8 Updates Further Past. Mm, hi everybody, I am Christian. This is Lazy Devs Academy. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at a new Pico 8 version. Yes, I do those reviews where I do those videos. I look at the versions of Pico 8 and walk you through new features, new updates that excite me that I think you should know about. Um, I have skipped a bunch of updates in between. So this is going to be our big catch up video where we go through all of the versions that we skipped and didn't talk about because of reasons but now those reasons are gone and we are embarking on a new bright future by the way one of the reasons was that i i got surgery do you want to see a cool scar huh, huh? everything went right everything was okay right so um the last time i made a video that was the version 0.2.4 now we are at currently at the version 0.2.5 E. But I'm gonna go actually chronologically and I want to talk about all of the changes that happened in 0.2.4 before we went to 0.2.5. So let's jump straight in. And I'm gonna be honest guys, but a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about today are not gonna be mind-blowing, you know, they're not gonna be game changers. But in the meantime, we amassed a lot of those features, so it's kind of worthwhile to just do, to, to get our ducks in a row, so to speak, right? And, and actually start talking about all the features, the little features that eventually add up to kind of a lot of stuff. So one thing that I, we already talked about a little bit uh, uh, during the stream is that there is an ability to kind of do a little bit of an animation preview in a graphics editor. There is some kind of functions for this right now. So let me draw this. Maybe it is this a bit too dark. Let me. So let's say we have this animation and you can like scroll through here and that's fine and good, but you can do a little bit better now. So with the button L, you can start, um, you can set a beginning and an end of a loop. So let's just go L here. It says set loop start. L here, it said set uh, loop end. And with the button Q and W, you can go through this animation now. You can see I can I can kind of step through this animation and it loops through, it like jumps back to the beginning. So now we kind of see kind of like this dripping thing. It's kind of weird that we had, um, yeah, we can go in both directions as well, right? So L sets start, L sets end, and then with Q and W, L, L and then yeah because once you click somewhere uh, then that whole thing gets reset so you have to after you set the end you can like um, loop through an animation that's cool that's kind of nice I always thought this was kind of already good enough one thing that is genuinely new and kind of like exciting is that it also works with larger sprites so um, before we had it like with this you know with this one single eight times eight pixel sprite but if your sprite is bigger, for example, like this big box, which consists of four individual sprites, so it's 16 times 16, we can make this bigger now. And then again, setting the beginning, clicking somewhere, setting end, and now we can go through this animation as well with QW and it will jump an entire, you know, an entire animation frame. It will skip. That's something that wasn't possible before. And now you can do it here. Really, really cool. Continuing on with UI stuff. So there is a, it's a bit silly, but you can now um, uh, paste big. <laughs> so if you do, um, if you draw like a sprite, like this little, little dot here, you can go uh, control copy to copy the sprite. And obviously you can go control V to paste it. But you can now also paste big. So control B pastes a bigger version of that sprite. It's two times as big. Another feature that I find actually really, really nice is you can press Control G as grid, G as grid, uh, to activate a grid. So you can now, when you do pixel loop work, sometimes it's kind of can be, can be difficult to see, you know, where the pixels start and end, and, and you know how many pixels there are. So with a grid, uh, you can kind of like see, you know, how many pixels there are. Really useful, especially if you start with like a you know empty sprite or you do work with a lot of monochrome kind of work. Nice, nice addition. And a final UI addition that is kind of, it's very special, but for those people that, that need it, they, it's, it's, it's a blessing. So down here, 
um, in the text editor, you down here you have like different modes of like gives you stats about your code, <clears throat> and there's this character count, right? Um, now it says five from so and so, um, but this character count is actually not indicative of um, the character count if you copied the code into Twitter. There's this whole thing, you probably know about it, where people make tweet cards with a red code that fits into a single tweet from this old website that used to exist now, but it kind of like goes away now. It's maybe done, maybe by the time this video comes out, it's not gonna be relevant anymore, who knows? But anyway, you can now control click there, and this gives you the character count as it would be if it was on Twitter. Now, and it also tells you that, you know, maximum is 280, that's how many characters fit into a tweet. Now, in this case, it doesn't matter, it's just five, right? But um, there might be situations where the characters are counted slightly different in Twitter. And for those situations, you will get here the Twitter count, control click on the character count. All right, so let's move on to some API stuff. There has been a small change. I want to discuss this. It's not being used that often. Let's just like print hello, right? That's how it looks. Let's put it in slightly slightly off, off the edge so we can see. Okay, hello. Now you know, you know, we, did, we went through that stuff. You can do um, those control codes that allow you, I have to look it up, uh, for example, wide, to make the hello really wide. And you can make it tall by adding the control code T to make it like really big. <clears throat> and you can also make it striped. Uh, and that changed. It used to be um, a control code uh, this dot, but that doesn't work anymore. Now, instead of the dot, it's control code equals striped. So this was the old control code for this effect. Now it has been changed into this. Now this is a bit weird because um, I was kind of confused by this <laughs> because um, what I was aware of is that there was this control code called uh, pinball, right? The pinball code. That is the control code P, fellow. <laughs> and that does the same thing, right? But the P is kind of like, it's, it's, it's a shortcut. It can come, because it's like three codes together, right? So you can combine all the three codes into one code. So the P is a shortcut, that doesn't change. The nice thing of uh, having those three control codes separate is that you can achieve slightly different effects. For example, if you leave one, or one out, for example, let's leave out the W. So it's just control code T and control code striped. Then you get like a condensed font, right? Or you can go the other direction. You can leave out the T, but keep the W. Then you get like an extended font, right? So this gives you slightly more control, but if you don't need a control, if you just want a pinball effect, you can just go slash uh, thing and P. Now the next thing, the next thing is a bit weird. I tried to wrap my head around. I'm not sure if I understand it, to be honest, but maybe you guys let me know. So you know how there was an update that introduced this ability to put the map, the map, I mean, this, this map here, to put this map in a different area of the memory. And the only legal place of putting it was basically this new uh, area of memory that was unlocked, this new whole additional RAM that we suddenly got in, in one of the versions. Now it's possible to put the map in an additional different place. However, that place is just the place where the map already was. You can just move it around in the space where the map previously was. Not a huge change and it, the behavior is kind of odd. So let's explore the behavior. All right, so I made like this little test program that shows you what's happening. This is just like, you know, I made some text. Uh, I will show it in a second. But yeah, this is the map, right? I just m painted the whole map with different colors. The upper half of the map is painted with a blue color. The lower half of the map is painted with this uh, burgundy, I guess, with this deep red color. And then I have a, like a little program that draws the map on the screen and I can pan the map around, I can explore the map. So this is just like the default setting, We're just drawing the map on the screen and we can scroll it around and you can see this is the upper portion of the map. I'm also writing the, the coordinates on the map with, with tiles. And then this is the lower portion of the map. The reason why I differentiate between the, the upper and lower half is that the lower half of the map, the red one, 
uh, that's actually being shared with the lower half of the sprite sheet, as you know. So if you use the whole sprite sheet, you don't get to use the red area. And if you, you want to use both areas of the map, then you can't use the lower half of the sprite sheet. That's kind of like always like this little thing in Pico 8. So far so good, but as you can see in the lower left corner, this tells you like the location at which the map currently is, like what, what we're putting into the into this uh, this address. This is the address, 5F56. And you can put different things in it. I'm just putting zero in here and just like, okay, whatever. Now we can start putting different values into this address to try to put the map somewhere else. And it will reject most of the things, but now it will actually accept some of the things and you will see in a second what happens. All right, so this is the map and I'm gonna start changing the, the value that we're putting in. And nothing changes and suddenly something changes. Oh, okay, so let's go back a little bit. So zero F, nothing changes, it's like the same thing. But once you put one zero, suddenly something weird happens. You can see our map is just the red part. And if I scroll down, you will see this actually just red part. It just, we just made the map smaller and we made it begin in the red part. Now, as I increase the value that we're putting into this address, you will see something funky happening. You will see the map kind of scrolls up and disappears until it becomes like a tiny little strip. You see, this is just like a tiny little strip. It, you know, the, the width doesn't change, but the height, is, it shrinks down and it shrinks down from the top. So now the, the top edge of the map is just the lower edge of the actual map in the, in the memory. Weird. Now, if you continue this, at some point, it flips back around. And now we see actually the full map again. If you put uh, 0x20 um, hexadecimal, it, you're just gonna get the full map. And then if you continue adding values, see this, it does the same thing. It scrolls, it shrinks from the top. And then, you know, continues going past and so forth. The highest value it accepts is 0x3f. And then if you put 0x40, then it um, resets to the default, which is just like the full map again. So you can kind of make the shrink the map a little bit and con confine it to an area of the map. Um, and it's weird. I don't exactly, I'm not sure why you need that because you can do that with a map anyway. You can just draw less of the map. That's one of the features in the map function. So I don't know. You guys let me know if you have an idea what you can do with this that you couldn't do before. Um, what I'm thinking is that maybe this was something that Zep needed to make some kind of internal functions work. And then he thought, oh, how about I just expose it to the, to the developers so maybe they can figure out some use for this. You guys let me know if you have a good use for this. Now, here is something that is really, really cool that I enjoy. I actually seen it in action and I really appreciate that this. We have this now. This is just really cool. You can now save a Pico 8 card into a URL. And I don't mean like uploading it somewhere and then sharing the URL. I mean the actual Pico 8 card, all of the data is encoded into a URL string. Let me show you. So let's say I want to show somebody how this new map feature works. I want to share it with somebody so they can check it out. Something I can do now is going to is type in save, add your URL. Oops, well, <laughs> I didn't test it before. I thought it maybe works. Well, it doesn't work because what it tries is to encode all of the code and all of the graphics and everything into a URL. If, if too much code, uh, it won't fit and then you get that problem. Uh, okay, I made something that's a bit simpler, just like a little hello world here. Let's try that again. So um, export, no, wait, save, very important, save at URL. There we go. Now this program was copied into the clipboard. So now I open up a web browser, I paste it in here, blop, and as you can see this looks like this weird character string, right? That's our data, that's the, our hello world code and everything that is encoded into the string. We run this, it would launch the education version of Pico 8 and it will load the card immediately.
Hello world. World. Hello world. This is really cool and useful, um, especially if people are, for example, um, looking for help in the forum or in the Discord and you want to show them something, how something works. This is a cool way of quickly sharing code. Um, it's obviously not good to, <laughs> as you can see, it's, you know, the, the limitations are quite severe, even for P2H standards. So uh, it's not really good to like share games or anything. But like little code snippets, for that, it is actually pretty good. Now, while we are talking about export and saving and all that stuff, there is a new thing that is also possible now, which I also, mm, I really, really like, to export the card image of a card. So as you know, one of the major features of Pico 8 is that it can save the entire game and all the graphics and music and everything. It can save this into a PNG image. And for that, it needs, uh, it, it creates like this label, this kind of like image of a card. And that label, that illustration in a card is something that you save uh, pressing F7. Uh, but it's always difficult to edit this yourself. You had to go jump through a bunch of hoops to put your own image in there because it can be a screenshot from the game, but there was a way of getting in your own images. For example, here, Pork Like, um, that illustration from Pork Like is not necessarily in the game. It uses some assets from the game, but it's, it's not necessarily from the game. I created it in Photoshop and imported it uh, into Pork Like through weird shenanigans, modifying the, the card, copying stuff, and, you know, complicated stuff. Now we're getting tools to uh, modify the card image directly. And I'm going to showcase how this works by actually fixing something that I don't know why this happened. Like this, at some point something got corrupted and this um, this image got little, like little, little dots here. So I want to remove the little dots. So let me step you through the process of fixing the card image to pork like. Right, so we have um, pork, we're gonna load this pork. Now we're gonna go export um, minus L for label, for card label. And we're gonna call this um, just to pork L, we're gonna call it porkle dot um, PNG. Okay, now the label was exported in its own little image. And fair enough, here's this little PNG here. Uh, I'm gonna open it with Photoshop uh, and you can already see there is a bit of a problem here. Um, yeah, so what happened here is that the, uh, the black uh, pixels in the card image were turned transparent. The weird thing is in the change log, there is a specific mention that this bug was fixed and now it's unfixed itself or maybe it wasn't never fixed in the first place. We don't really know what happened. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna fix this, um, um, the, the little artifacts that happened here. We're gonna fill it with black. Bam. All right, we're gonna save this. There it is, there's our new fixed image. And now we want to bring this image back into, uh, into the cart, into our, into our game. And that works exactly how you think it would work. You would just type an import minus L porkle.png. Now it's imported. Now it's important that we save this. And here we are. The, the card image is here and you can see it is all cleaned up. So now this problem was fixed. We were able to modify the card image just by <clears throat> using import and export commands. Now there is a little bug here that I want to, or not bug, but there is a little aspect here that I want to, um, to showcase. And if you watch the um, Shape of Mind stream uh, one of the episodes we actually uncovered this problem <clears throat> and that is it this process doesn't work with the alternate color palette so if you mess around with the color palette and if you add some of the secondary of the secret colors then well the card image functionality is technically capable of um, tr keeping track of the colors it can actually so it supports all 32 colors if you export a car um, an image from a card that uses secondary colors, it will um, it will look nice. The, the PNG will look nice. It will have 32 colors. But if you then re-import that image that has 32 colors or uses the 30, full 32 colors into the card, it will change it back to the regular 16 colors. So if you take this image here, which uses weird colors, like for example, the lime color, which is a very nice color, 
And if you import it into your card, the line changes into a yellow. Now there's a way of getting around this, but you have to use the old ways, you know, making screenshots and copy and pasting data between cards and so forth. Hopefully this feature will get fixed and expanded in the future because I really, really like it. Now, moving on to the far distant future of 0.2.5. This update brought in two major features in Pico 8. Um, not necessarily mind-blowing things that you have to know about immediately, but things that definitely help along the way. Feature number one, you can type in help. You always could type in help, but now you can have help to certain topics. For example, help print. Now it shows you how the print statement works, but also, and that's kind of like really nice, it also shows you some PA ASCII codes to kind of like, uh, if you forgot, you know, how to set the background color and the foreground color, you don't have to open up the, you know, browser and go to that horrible, horrible wiki website with all the advertisements. I, I, what's, what's with that, you know? You can just do it directly here in Pico 8. This is going to be a huge, huge deal to, uh, you know, when new people are coming into Pico 8, that the fact that it can look things up. And uh, to be honest, like, I'm probably going to use this as well. Like, I always forget the control code to set the foreground and background color. This is nice. Stay tuned at the end of the video because using this function, we can also get a bit of a glimpse of what is coming up in the future of a very, very important feature that we all looking forward to. Mm -hmm. But first, uh, I want to talk about a feature that is very, very important to me and that should be more important to you than it already is. And that is custom fonts. Pico 8 now officially supports variable width custom fonts. What does that mean? What are variable with custom fonts? Hmm, let me explain. This will take some time. Okay, so first let's go through the process of setting up a custom font. You go load hashtag uh, font underscore snippet. This loads, this downloads a script um, that uh, Zep prepared for us that allows us to create our own custom fonts. This, there's a manual here explaining exactly how things work. Um, I'm gonna run this. You can see this is our custom font. Everything is nice and peachy. You can see it's displayed on the screen. And the text down there says that the custom font, the code to make this font appear in your game is copied into the clipboard. Perfect. And now this is where you would edit your own font. You would create your own font. You would replace, you will go to the sprite sheet and you would replace uh, all of the letters uh, with your own let creations, with your own letters. Sweet. So let's say I did that. Let's say I went to a guy on the internet who makes awesome fonts and I got a font from them and I just like, hey, bam, 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 putting the fonts in. Look here, I have something prepared. Bam, drag and drop. Ooh, look at that font. Look at that sweet, sweet font. That looks nice. That looks good. Let's run this. Is that good though? That looks weird, right? So the, the letters are, the spacing is weird, right? Like, so there's way too much spacing between the letters. Okay, no problem, no problem. Because you can change the width of the letters here and the width and width two. Width two refers to like the special characters down there, but we just want to maybe bring it down to six. Okay, that looks better, but now some of the letters merge with each other. The M, for example, you see the M at, it jumps how the M and the P merge together. Or the A and Z on the lazy, like they merge together. So that's not good. We, we squished them too much. But on the other hand, other letters, the spacing is way too big. For example, the I and C in quick, that's a huge space in between there. It looks like a new word, right? Like the quick. Brown, <laughs> right? It doesn't look like quick. It looks like a space in between there. Uh, why is that happening with this font? The reason why is because this specific font is a variable with font, which means uh, the letters, the individual glyphs in the, in the font, they change in size depending on what the individual letter needs. The font we had previously or was a so-called monospace font, which is a very, very special type of font where each letter is exactly, you know, the same size. Monospace fonts are very, very common and very popular in, in PCs. 
uh, in computer applications because you know they very easy to deal with. It's very predictable how long a word is gonna be, right? So most of the you know lo-fi kind of stuff, Game Boy fonts and so forth, they're often are um, monospace fonts. And so far, all of the fonts in Pico 8 were monospace fonts. This standard Pico 8 font, this font here, that's a monospace font. It is always three character in width and five character in height, each letter, right? But the problem with the monospace fonts is that they look, they look a little bit, they don't always look really great in terms of typography. They kind of like can feel a little bit like sometimes some letters just use way more space than they need to. So you have to draw them in a weird way. So to kind of justify the amount of space they get, you know, um, they kind of like also look, look very squarish, you know, not very organic. And also they use up more space because, you know, when you have an eye that is just like a little, little thin thing, you still have to give it all those space because you, you know, expect every letter to have the same amount of space. And this can be bad, especially if your font is big. And this is maybe one of the reasons why people didn't really latch on to the custom font feature. One of the many reasons is like, you know, if you have like this font, it's huge, right? You just waste all the space. It's just like, uh, and it looks like the, this in your face kind of thing. But now we got the ability to define the width of each individual glyph. Each individual letter can be now defined. So we can use variable width fonts like this one, and we can say like the I is just gonna be a very, very thin letter, and the M is gonna be an extra wide letter because it needs that space. This will make the font seem a lot more organic, and it will also use less space. The way that works is explained in the thread. So this is the thread on lexlove.com about the 0.2.5 version, and if you scroll down, here is a paragraph about the variable width uh, Pico 8 fonts and explains exactly you know, what addresses you put the information and how it's encoded and all that stuff. And to be honest, like if I just had like this, I would be it, I would be struggling to make it work. But here's a really nice little helper function that you can use. And with this helper function basically says like this character, character, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Uh, this function says this character, uh, you save a character as a string in, in, a, in a variable C. Uh, this is supposed to be this wide, you know. Now it's a bit more complicated. It's not the width in pixels. Instead, it's an adjustment. So you get a, give it a value. And depending on what the value is, it gets, you know, uh, either it's a default or plus one, plus two, plus three, or minus four, minus three. Minus. So it like... It, expects a default width and then you can tweak it each letter minus and plus to that default width. And then you can even like uh, set the uh, character as higher or lower for, you know, like for Latin accents. And if you want to know exactly where the stuff is being put, um, I've prepared a new version of Memsplore. Um, so let me show you exactly where that information goes. So this um, peach colored strip down here that you see, that is the strip in memory responsible for the custom font. And now you can see there's like these three gray dots in the middle and uh, in, in the beginning here. These are actually used to define the character widths for the, each individual character. So the way this works is like at the very, very beginning of the section, you have like some custom, the custom, the default widths and default width for the lower characters and height and so forth and offset or whatever. There's some undocumented parts here, but then you get the, um, you know, the section where you start defining the character widths for each individual character. And the way Pico 8 gets away with this, like where does the space come from? Like there was this, the empty space all this, all this time? Not quite, but it's actually really smart. So the way this works is it actually uses this space for these characters. You see, there's no characters there, but it's actually, there is some, ASCII characters that control, you know, line breaks and so forth. They're just invisible. They never printed as glyphs, as actual visible symbols. And so what Pico 8 does here is basically you can just start writing stuff in this area, in the area responsible for those characters. And that stuff gets interpreted as character widths. Now I created a little card here um, uh, that actually goes through this process and actually takes this font that I showed you that I got from a, a font designer and it applies custom character widths for each individual character. Here, I'm gonna show you a little bit here. 
So um, there is a, a default width of six characters, six, um, six pixels. And then I have like the, the um, an array called spacing where I go through the different characters. So these characters are default six. These characters here are plus one. These characters are plus two. Um, these characters are minus three. So the eyes are very, very narrow. So they're minus three in pixels and so forth. And you know, this has gone done basically experimentally. I got some data from the font designer themselves, but also like tweeted myself a little bit for the character widths that I didn't have. <coughs> And then I have this, this function here called apply spacing, where I just go through my array, my spacing array, and just go through each individual character in that array. And I use this adjust char uh, function. And that is just taken, this adjust char function is just taken straight from the thread on lexlove.com. This is something that um, Zep wrote. So I'm just like, just dumping all of this information into this function that Zep did. And if you do it, everything correctly, this all this information gets actually exported uh, in in the string. So you really have to do it at the beginning when you set up the font, but later you don't have to think about it. It just works. So how does it look? It looks amazing. Mm, mm, beautiful typography. Ah, oh, I love it. Look at how how the I has exactly the right amount of space, how the M gets the extra space because it's so wide, the I gets, you know, just a little, little tiny slot. It looks nice and even, organic, easily readable, but also uses little space. Mwah. Mwah. So this code, as it, as it says at the, at the bottom, is copied into the clipboard and now you can bring it to your own program. And as I can see, like I made a new fresh card. So this is the card, it has some in it. It has some draw where it prints some stuff. I'm using the fancy outline print function to show you some stuff, but yeah, here we go. Sphinx of black chords judge my vow using upper and lowercase characters. Oh, oh. And just like to, to make sure that people understand this doesn't use the sprite sheet anymore. All of that information from the sprite sheet was copied into a big string and this is the part, this part here, this here, that is the part that is being um, exported into the clipboard in the previous card, in this um, uh, code snippet card. And then you can paste it in here into your own code. That's the thing that you paste into your own code. And then you get custom font and you just like activate a custom font using this and it just works. Now, there is a second reason, obviously, why people are not really like flocking into the custom font space, and that is designing fonts is really, really difficult. Like this, it's a really good way to make your game really pop and look unique because you're so used to how fonts look in P8. So every time somebody uses a different font and one that is even big and, and you know looks so good as like this one, that will make your game pop for sure. But it's difficult to pull this off, you know, making a font is difficult. You have to go through all this process, design all of the little different letters and so forth. That just like, that's a huge, huge uh, challenge, huge project, right? So I'm happy to introduce to you a person that might help you out with this one. This is Sompix, Sompix, Sompix. Uh, it is a, a pixel font designer that I teamed up with it a little bit uh, to make this, this demo work. And as you can see, this person makes beautiful, beautiful pixel fonts on itch.io. You can download them if you want to. Um, not all of them are uh, Pico 8 compatible because some of them are a little bigger than what Pico 8 supports. Uh, the biggest uh, character a Pico 8 can draw is eight times eight. And some of those uh, fonts use bigger characters. So not all of them will be Pico 8 compatible, but some of them are. So we work together to um, import one of the fonts into Pico 8 and the font that we're talking about is this one called Voice. As you can see, it has been used by Pancake Delicious. Yes, beautiful. Mm, mm. Off the bat, we are kind of like in good company here. Uh, so yeah, we took this font and we converted it and then went through the steps and learned how to do this works in Pico 8. And, um, and yeah, made it work in Pico 8. So the oldest code that I showed you, you know, that the modifications I did to the font snippet stuff, the pixel font that I showed you that I ended up 
implementing the, the character widths and everything. All of this stuff is now for you downloadable. You can just click here, download voice.p8. That's right, that's a P8 version of this font available from itch.io. It's free, you don't have to buy this font, but if you end up using it, why not support the creator? At least, at least let him know that he used his font. I think he will be pretty, pretty stoked. So download this font, use it in your game. I think it will be really, really cool improvement to any kind of PQ8 game. And of course, um, yeah, we are in talks. We're gonna see if we can make the other fonts, um, can export them in PQ8 versions as well. When we do, I will let you know. So these were the major, major features of version uh, 0.2.5e. Now we're gonna get to the nitty gritty little details that are cool to know. Uh, let's do a huge roundup of the UI changes in this version. So when you are in the map layer now, oops, this is maybe a bit too much. So we are in the map and the way the selection works in the map is now slightly different and pretty cool. So let's see, let's say, I select something here, right? I can now use the keys to move it around. But as you can see, it doesn't like, like it's, it's a floater now, it floats above the map. So as I move it around, it doesn't delete stuff underneath and so forth. I can, it's now, it's kind of like its own layer on top of the map. And I can actually start drawing around in this layer and it will not draw on stuff underneath, right? So this is kind of like its own little drawing area now that is removed from the rest of the map. And it, it, it can only get placed when I remove the selection, right? Now it's merged with the background. It seems like obvious and natural because that's how you used to this maybe work in Photoshop or something like this. But, um, but yeah, that wasn't the way it worked before. There's a little, again, this little thing got a little updated here when you go to the compressed capacity. When you uh, control click here, you actually get a live update of the compressed bytes. So as your program gets bigger and you start you know, bumping against limitations, you can get some live updates when you're starting to shave off the individual letters to see if you can fit your program within the limitations. Nice. Uh, one little thing is in, the, in this editor, in the graphics editor, control H activates hex mode. So we had that here in the map editor, control H hex mode, where you had, would have like the hex value of the different uh, tiles represented in, in the, uh, in the, on the map it was really useful for situations where um, two tiles were identical and you wanted to distinguish them without having to change them. Um, well, now you can do this also in, in, in this mode. So now it shows you like, you know, this tile, that's tile number 038, uh, number 38, in hexadecimal is 26. Now here's a little little detail that I loaded up pork like for this because I really want to show you uh, a lot of code. Uh, control, if you keep control pressed and use the scroll wheel, you can scroll sideways. And a final little addition, which is really, really cute. If you turn off the sound, now I turn off the sound, if you then reboot, it doesn't play the sound, but it shows you sound notes. And that's, that's cute, but also there's a re good reason for this. So the idea is that if you turned off the sound, you know if you were supposed to hear the sound or not. Because right now I turn off the sound of PQ8, I know the sound of my computer is working, uh, so I see the notes. If I don't hear the sound, I still see the notes, so I know that the sound is turned off in Pico 8. If I didn't see the notes and I didn't hear anything, that I know that something with my setup is wrong. Just a little indicator here. Helps with some debugging stuff. And that is all of the UI changes. Now let us go into like the code API kind of changes. Some of the stuff is really, really nice. Actually, I used some of the stuff in the variable with code that I've showed you just briefly. Um, so there is a different way of, ad of sampling individual characters from a string. So if you have a character, uh, you have a string, something like, you know, never gonna give you up. I gotta use it. I got, I just, I just can't not use it. Right. Um, then you can go print. And previously, if you wanted to have, for example, the V from never, right, you would have to use the sub function and it's like oh it's just such a pain it's just like 
TXT and then it's like the beginning and the end and then close, close, then you can run it and then you get the V, right? Well, now you can, it's a little bit easier now, you can use the string as if it was an array with each array being each individual, uh, each array entry being each individual letter. So if you want the third letter from the string, we're just gonna go txt square brackets three. There we go, there's the V. And then if you want the E after the V, it's gonna be four. And if you're gonna go with the R from never, it's gonna be five and so forth. Now there are some limitations to this. For example, um, you cannot do something like uh, txt square brackets five. You cannot assign. That's that doesn't work. Sadly. E. But uh, just being able to read individual characters from a string is very very useful. I find myself quite often in situations where I want to read out a string character wise. So for something you can, for example, do now is something you do like for. Um, t uh, in all txt, you can do a for and all loop here and then print a t and run. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so yeah, so some things work, some things don't work. Uh, you have to figure this out. Oh, by the way, another thing that doesn't work is you cannot get a random character from a string. That doesn't work. If you do like something like hello, um, 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 you won't get a random letter from hello. That doesn't sadly doesn't work. It you just get zero. There we go. At this end, at the end, there's a zero. It's it's it would cause a lot of confusion because the, the, what happens is this hello gets converted into a number, and then you get a random from it. So in case you have 45, then you get a random number between 0 and 45 and not either the 4 or the 5. Now um, sub has changed a little bit as a result of this. So um, let's go print sub um, uh, test text uh, and then uh, 3 and then nil. If you do this, it returns xt, the rest of the string. Previously, it would return just a single character. Um, uh, but now we have this different way of accessing individual characters, so this was reverted. Just to let you know, this is how sub works now. Okay, while we're talking about printing, there's another thing that is actually kind of nice. We have word wrap now, so um, or character wrap. Let me show you. So if you poke into the address, let me, I wrote, wrote it down, 0x, 5f is actually a pretty famous address. We're gonna look at it in a second in Memsplore. 5f36. And if we poke a 0x80, so hexadecimal 80 in, in there, then if we have a long, like if we print something, let's just print something for now. Uh, okay, nothing. But now let's write uh, some longer text. Me, the world, or me. Word wrap. So if it's too long, it just wraps around and starts a new line. How cool is that? Now, it's not exactly word wrap, it's, um, it's character wrap. So it will interrupt the word. It just so happens to be like this text just so happens to have a space there. So if you replace it by Super Mario World in just like one big word, it will separate Super Mario World without consideration for, you know, <laughs> any kind of grammatical rules, right? But it still might be useful in some ways. Uh, let's look at the, uh, real quick at the address that we're talking about. So this is 5F36, and it is an address that it says miscellaneous chipset features. I, I used to write something else in there, but I just realized it got like, this one address controls a lot of different things. So like the first two bits are about this undocumented multi-screen feature. It's it's wide. Just look it up. Multi-screen PQ8. It's crazy. Um, then the the, th uh, the third one, disabling this ability of if when you print uh, after a print statement, a new line gets added. Uh, if you set it to one uh, after a print statement, a new line is not being added. So you can continue printing the same line. Then. Um, 
The next one is, this one causes the uh, sprite number zero to be rendered as opaque instead of transparent. This is some, the next one is about something about default values for sget and mget and pget and so weird stuff. The next one is about uh, dampen filter and so forth. Uh, I'm not sure what this one is, but this last bit, that is the one that enables the word wrap. So this is kind of like this little control panel, depending on what kind of bit you set, weird functions in Pico 8 get activated. So yeah, if you really want to experiment with this, I suggest you check out the um, Pico 8 wiki, yes, on fandom, sadly. Uh, and you can see that the, the, here's a documentation of all of the different things that you can do with this one specific address. All right, the next one is, that's difficult to explain and I'm not, I'm just not gonna be able. I'm just not gonna be able to showcase this in an uh, example card simply because I am not so in tune with T-line behavior. I didn't have, I didn't get my T-line feet wet enough yet. But uh, you can see there was a tweet by uh, Frederick Sucho um, and he was making this, um, this Wolfenstein kind of game using the T-line statements. As you can see, if you're using T-line, you sometimes got a bit wobbly, right? Like this is using SSPR and this is now using T-line. If you use T-line, suddenly, you know, this gets a bit of a squiggly lines here. It's not quite as precise as um, SSPR. And he tweeted this at Zep and Zep was like, oh, okay, I, I mean, squiggliness is kind of like to be expected, but uh, Zep really wanted the T-line to be more precise than SSPR. So one of the new features in 0.2.5D, that's in the most recent version that just came out a couple of days ago, <clears throat> that and you can call T-line with just single value. And that single value would set a different precision for the T-line statement. I'm just gonna mention this real quick. Again, like if you're not using T-line, if T-line is less like way above your head, then just you can just skip to the next section here. But just wanna mention this for people who are into T-line. This value here basically says how precise the MX, MY, MDX, MMDI um, uh, units are. So just like to reminder, like this is the usual T-line statement. Like what's with the advertisement here? What is this? I don't, Elon Musk, what? Uh, anyway, so it's, you see like you have MX and MY, MDX, MDY. This is basically the location on the map from where you're sampling pixels. And MDX and MDY are, you know, how much you're moving um, this, your sampling location. Uh, along the uh, along the map as you draw the line on the screen and usually the unit used here was tiles so uh, advance you're changing the, uh, the the value by one would advance by eight pixels and that was fine and good but it, you got rounding errors and you we saw those rounding, rounding errors in the tweet right we saw that Sometimes it got, got, got a little bit jittery. So now you can change the units by which you're defining the position from which you're sampling to something that's more precise. Uh, and the way you do is you is you call T line with a single value. So T something like T line 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 uh, thirteen. That is the default. If you thirteen means it's a magic number. Thirteen means it is, uh, we're measuring the location from which we're sampling in tiles. But if you want to have something more precise, you can do T line 14, and this will be twice as precise. So now we're measuring in half tiles or four pixels. If you set it to 16, now you, we change, we increase the resolution, uh, the unit that we are measuring. Now we're measuring in individual pixels. So now we define the point from which we're sampling on the map in pixels. And hopefully then we get less rounding errors. This is all I'm gonna say about this. I do not have example code to show you, showcase the difference. I think the T-line stuff is kind of the thing. I have to have more experience with this myself. And maybe in the future, we're gonna do like a dedicated T-line tutorial. I'm not gonna make promises right now, but I will try. Anyway, if you're using T-line, this is the way to get more precision out of T-line. And this is basically it. There's some little juicy tidbits and <laughs> somebody found an infinite token exploit. Uh, Golan Gazette found it. 
using some kind of shenanigans uh, and so forth, you could get infinite tokens in Pico 8. Obviously not infinite compressed. There was other limitations that you, you, you couldn't just create an arbitrarily large game, but there was a way of creating a game of tricking Pico uh, 8 into thinking you're using uh, less token than you're actually using. Now this was patched, but there was another one. Yeah, so this is my password here. Found another exploit, which is actually really easy to use, just using some um, some um, command blocks and so stuff like that. Yikes, yeah, so you can have infinite tokens and that one is still not patched. That's why, and you reset some other bugs that I talked about previously in this video. That's why I am expecting, I think there's gonna be a zero point 2.5 F because there's also sadly some other bugs that also cropped up. So yeah, 0 0.2.5 E causes some problems on mobile um, handheld devices, especially like the Game Force or um, the Embernic devices. Um, here I recorded a video to kind of showcase you uh, what it looks like. Now, if you use the most current version on the Game Force, it boots up into the um, uh, normally, and you hear the beeping of the Pico 8 when it launches. There we go. But you don't, uh, and you can even hear sound effects of the games, but you don't see any screen, right? And that is kind of some, I don't know, some kind of bug that cropped up in uh, the version 0.2.5e. Uh, so if you're using uh, those kind of devices, you don't upgrade to E, just stick with C for now. 0.2.5c still works. Not sure about D, might, might be already a problem. Uh, but yeah, C is safe to update to. Now let's talk a little bit about the future of Pico 8. So one feature that I'm really looking forward to, and I think everybody else is also looking forward or waiting for, is obviously the high score feature. The high score list, something that Peter, that Zep is working on. So um, Zep is setting up a server system and you know account system and so forth. So you, uh, when you launch Pico 8, you log in or something with a, your Alex Lovell account into a server and then you can submit your high score to a server. And th obviously this requires a whole, this opens a whole can of worms, you know? It's not just like, you know, drag and drop uh, the package from the Unity store that says multiplayer high score, <laughs> and it just works. It does not work like this, guys, seriously. So anyway, yeah, Zep has been, has a little text here describing exactly what he's been working on. This whole thing is way more complicated than he thought. He, had, he thought he could use some off-the-shelf solutions, open source solutions. He can't, so he had to recode everything from scratch. He set up five servers around the world that will uh, be taking care of all the different uh, high score stuff. And he's um, updated his doodle mat. I think this is now broken. Uh, it doesn't really work anymore, but he made like this MMO kind of thing where you could um, stress test the system to, to make sure that it will work when it gets implemented in Pico 8. Now, this has not been implemented in the current version, still not yet, sadly. It's coming up soon, but we did get a little bit of a glimpse of how this will look like. So, if you type in help sc score sub, we're gonna get some information about how this will work. So, this is gonna be the function that will be used to submit scores to the server. So, you can see score sub. Um, it um, accepts three parameters. One is the table, one is the uh, table name, basically, the name of the table that you're submitting to. It's a database, right? So kind of like the table, then you the actual score that you're submitting, and some extra information. So the table is a string that identifies a table. So for example, it, here is, um, it says um, level one, right? So each it, it seems like each card will automatically get assigned uh, some databases. Um, so you cannot access the database of a different card. Your own card will get a database and that will also, I assume, will prevent cheating. People cannot like edit your code and then submit, you know, like remove all the enemies and then submit the high score to, to that high score table because once you edit the card, the card will, I assume, um, get its, its own high score list. So that edited hacked code would get its own high score list that is um, different from the real legitimate high score list. 
which also I think means that if you update your code, if you change your code and you release a new version, that also means that all of the high scores get deleted, seems like. We're gonna see how that works. Maybe there's a way of, of uh, maintaining backwards compatibility. Anyway, then you submit a score, which is a number. Higher is better, and the top 64 scores are returned in a table with fields name, score, extra, and date. You also get a date, interestingly, which, ooh, that opens up <laughs> some more problems. Um, yeah, so if you do the score sub um, and then the name of the table without any score or anything, you will just get uh, the top 64 entries from the high score list. And there is this little bit that is optional, you don't have to submit it, but the third parameter that you submit to a high score list is extra, and that is spicy. So this says extra is a binary string of metadata smaller or equal 768 bytes long. So you can submit a string that is pretty long, Six, 768 bytes is a lot of string. You can upload a lot. Like potentially this, you could even upload like a replay of your of your game. This is, I mean, maybe not, but also like maybe yes, like it's, it, you can do a lot with 768, so that's good. And Zeb already talked about how you can maybe use this to do some kind of cloud storage solution. So, you know, people, you don't save, save your game on the local uh, save data, which is quite limited compared to this, um, but you can upload it to the cloud somehow. Maybe there's a high score table and then you write your data in a high score table, but I'm not sure how that should supposed to work because it's like only 60, top 64 are being saved. So like, if too many people are playing your game, your data get deleted. Like, uh, I'm not sure how that works. You guys take a look at this and at the comments or that Zip did in that thread and try to figure this out because this is interesting, interesting, interesting. So this is it today. We caught up fully with all of the updates in PQ8. Again, as I said, I do expect some more hot fixes coming up because there's still some bugs remaining that I think we need to take care of. There's more interesting stuff coming up on the horizon. And also, please, please start using some of the custom font features. I think they're awesome, especially with the variable width. I think this is a big, big deal. I hope that the font that we created by some picks, um, the, the voice font that we provided, I think that might be a good way to get you started, get on the custom font train. I think this is a good train that goes to a good station. And hopefully there's gonna be even more custom fonts coming from some picks in the future. I'm gonna keep you posted on that. Christmas is coming up and Christmas obviously is the time of giving. And at this point, I would like to extend a big, big, big thank you to all of those wonderful people over at Coffee who supported my channel and my work throughout this year. Thank you so much for your support, guys. Yes, and a warm welcome to the new supporters that we've gained over the last month or so, including Shattered Polygon, Farley, Ben Smith, Wael Al, Herr Gilbert, Yasser Al Hamadi, Iron Taco, Madman, San Pinata, Mikoa, and Slacks. So yeah, here is the list of all current supporters and as always special shout outs to the growing Donut Plus crew, including Jer, Chaz, Creeperspeak, Lennart Steinke, Heinz Stampfli, Brennan Black, Will Brown, Tom Hall, Sean Manget, Ted Carter, BB Samurai, Andrew Edstrom, Likely Culprit, Senior Baup, Kixel Studio, Haiku Noodle, Tarek, Scott Goldsmith, Dr. Zamako, Scoush, Soup, Caesar Townsend, Meats, Captain Bly, Dracula, Caleb Blankenbaker, KCA Childers, Andrea D'Amicio, Leon, Nexalam, Code Logic, Chemix, Pixel Johan, ADG, Brian Baldwin, Scotty, GBG, Birion Davis, Andrew, Shaya, Degako, Jan, Art Sturgeon, Angelo Dante, Maciek, Lost Deku, Bellorek, Pendletonk, Groove MD, Lackmare, The Coxworth, Cheap Shot, One Eyed Rabbit, Mario Carballo, Kevin Thompson, Pavel Shimchukovsky, Bretsky, Emperor Snow, and Nork. And if you aren't already, you can also support this channel on coffee. Check out coffee.com slash lazydevs.
So this is it. This is the end of the video. Sorry for being so long. Again, you know, you know how it is. Just, just a lot of stuff that we have to cover. And sorry for not releasing any more updates. Still working on that uh, shmup tutorial follow-up on the phase two of the shmup. You know, I had to do something else in between there, but now everything is cool. We're off and we are about to start phase two of the shmup. Stay tuned, coming up soon. See you next time around, guys. Bye-bye. Have a great Christmas.